Here we go. All right, everybody, welcome. It's the first Wednesday of the first month of the new year. So 2024 kicking off tonight. Um, we're back with a, a, another round of episodes of Talking Trout. Um, our, our guest tonight is Russ Thurow. He's a, a former Wisconsinite raised and, you know, born and raised here in Wisconsin. And he'll, I'll let him kind of tell his backstory in that. But um, Russ is going to be on talking about the, um, probably one of the most important conservation issues of our time right now. And that's the, the Snake River and, and what's happened to the salmon, the steelhead population out there. Um, when we look at some of the threats that they face regarding, you know, we hear a lot about the, the four lower snake dams that um, that everybody's pushing to, well, a lot of folks are pushing to, to have removed and um, what we can do um, as a society, basically, to make sure that this population of fish um, not only survives, but thrives in the future. So um, Russ has been, has been, has basically spent his entire career studying the, the fish in this, in this region. And uh, he's got a ton of information for us. Um, so we're super excited to have him. I will say, you know, um, it is a little bit of a stretch for us um, doing talking trout. Like up until now, all of our topics and subjects have been Wisconsin centric, um, you know, but I think the, given the importance of the, the national importance of the issue. And um, I, I also think as we talk through this and, and through the discussions that we have, like we will find um, some common ground or some similarities between what's happening out on the West coast and, and what we're facing here back home and some of our own home waters. So um, that being said, I'll remind everybody, once again, if you got questions, drop them in the chat. We'll get to them in a little bit when, when Russ is finished with his presentation. And Russ, I am going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. And I also want to thank Bob Retko and his wife, Pat. Um, Bob and I reconnected. We were classmates at Stevens Point, and I drove back to Wisconsin in October, actually stayed with him, and Bob had the idea of doing something like this and reached out to Mike and here we are tonight. So I'm gonna get started, I'm gonna share my screen. I have a lot of information I'm gonna cover. Again, if you have questions, just put them in the chat box or write them down and we'll get to them after. So let's see here, I'll share my screen. And come on. Just trying to get it on full screen here. Hmm. There we go. Okay, so again, I'm gonna talk about the science of recovering wild snake river Chinook salmon and steelhead. So first of all, a lot of people talk about this issue as really, really complex. And if you look at the needs of the fish, it's actually really not that complex because these fish need three things. First of all, uh-oh. Okay. First of all, they need spawning and rearing habitat, which we refer to as natal habitat. Then they need a migration corridor to and from the ocean, to it as smolts, from it as adults. And that's where we're gonna talk about a metric called SAR. And then they need an estuary and an ocean. And basically our snake river fish have two of the three. What they lack is a suitable migration corridor because that corridor has been dramatically altered as I'll explain. Two life stages I want you to remember as we're going through the talk. The first one is the egg to pre-smolt stage from when the females bury the fertilized eggs, the alevins hatch, the fry emerge, they rear for varying periods in fresh water, and then they migrate out to the ocean. That occurs entirely in that fresh water, spawning and rearing or natal habitat. The second life stage is smolt to adult stage. That's where that acronym SAR comes from. From when the smolts hit the estuary and ocean, the adults grow, eventually come back, and that's where the SARs are measured. And the Power Council has set a goal of 4% on average with a range of two to six. And what that means is for every 100 smolts that go to the ocean, four adults return. Columbia Basin that we're part of here historically was the most productive Chinook salmon habitat in the world. How many fish 
in the days when the land belonged to God, one of my favorite Charlie Russell paintings, immense numbers. A couple of quotes here. 1832, Idaho Shoshone were as reliant upon salmon as other tribes were on bison. The run of salmon was such that with willow traps, as many as 300 were caught in a few hours, weighing from 20 to 60 pounds. And this is from the Lemhi River, which is where I, near where I live, annual catch of 60,000 pounds. Historical range and abundance, immense. In 1805, Meriwether Lewis wrote, salmon numbers are almost inconceivable. And think about that for a second, because the core of discovery came across the Great Plains where they saw literally millions of bison, antelope, plains elk, and mule deer, yet they struggled for words to describe the abundance of salmon. How many estimates are between 10 and 16 million annually came into the Columbia Basin, two to six million of those into the Snake River, which is that red outline. Here's a, a photograph. In 1883, 2.3 million Chinook were harvested just in the lower main stem. Doesn't include the upper Columbia or any of the Snake River Basin. And look at the size of these fish. And the Snake River was disproportionately important because although it comprised less than 20% of the flow, it supported more than half the steelhead, 45% of the summer Chinook, and almost 40% of the spring Chinook. And those immense numbers of fish created immense values. To give you some context, humans have been relying on salmon in the Columbia Basin for at least 16,000 years. And that number keeps getting pushed back farther with each new archeological site. And that they were for essential food, for cultural and ceremonial reasons. And they remain that today. These are some Nez Perce kids and they will tell you DNA, the DNA of salmon is literally in their DNA. These fish are also very important for recreation and nutritional needs of Euro-Americans, and this was a very common catch in Idaho into the 1960s. In the 50s and 60s, you could harvest two salmon a day. You could fish for six weeks for spring Chinook, five weeks for summer Chinook, almost three months season, and you could fish the entire snake, salmon, clear water, main stem, and tributaries. And these immense numbers of fish really were the economic engines for river communities like the one I live in for outfitting, tackle, food, clothing, lodging, etc. These fish are also ecologically essential. They're biologically extraordinary. They're what we call a keystone species, which means they have a disproportionate influence on their environment. And there are more than 135 species that depend on salmon, and this is both aquatic and terrestrial. And you may not know that salmon nutrients are actually found in the trees up on the hillsides of these systems because the eagles and the wolves and the other predators drag salmon carcasses up and those nutrients end up in the terrestrial system. So they're really Idaho and Northwest icons. I live in Salmon, Idaho on the Salmon River at the base of the Salmon Mountains. So obviously the settlers understood the value and the importance of these fish. So what's the current status? Well, sadly, like a lot of topics today, it depends on who you ask. Here's a quote by McMorris Rogers from Washington, and she said in 2023, salmon runs are improving at record rates. And here's Newhouse, also from Washington. Salmon returns are higher than they've been in years. What do the data-driven assessments say? Snake River, Chinook salmon, and steelhead are at increasing rate risk of extinction, even though a vast area of high quality remains. And today, one to 2% of historic wild Chinook salmon and steel numbers return. All populations face extinction. So the reality is, based on the data and the evidence, the Grim Reaper is literally walking off with our wild fish. How dire is it? A 2023 assessment found that more than 40% of spring Chinook and almost 20% of steelhead have declines to the quasi-extinction threshold. That means less than 50 spawners per year for four consecutive years. And without some dramatic change, over three quarters of Chinook and over 40% of steelhead are predicted to drop to that by 2025. Snake River into the 1880s when runs were already declining from other factors, still had a million half Chinook. 
1995, less than 1,200 returned. So basically, the population collapsed. That's a 99% decline. What were the causes? Well, the federal agencies termed them the four H's. Excessive harvest being the first one into the early 1900s, it was up to 80% harvest. There were 29 canneries operating on the Columbia River. Degraded natal habitat, hatchery practices that reduced wild fish production, and impassable hydro extirpated fish. So we can ask the question, what's left in a snake? That red area is what's undammed in the Snake River Basin, much of it in wilderness. And there still are 3,000 miles of good to excellent habitat. So what are the trends in Chinook in this good habitat? And again, sadly, it depends on who you ask. In 2016, court mandated open houses reported that salmon and steelhead abundance is improving. This was by the Columbia Basin systems operation group. And they showed this plot. And they went on to say, these graphs show the number of natural origin fish. They represent the most complete data available. And I'll be honest, I know a lot about these numbers and I was very surprised to see this. And my first reaction was, I wanted to believe. I really wanted to believe the fish were doing well, but the reality is they're not. And this is the actual trend. And what the systems operation folks have done is they parsed out this little piece of data to make it look like the fish were actually improving when you can see the long-term trend. So one of the things that's hampered recovery is distortion of the truth. And if you forget everything else I say tonight, I hope that you will become like John Adams and make sure that facts remain stubborn. We need to make sure people are basing decisions on the facts. Eldis Huxley said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you mad. And this should make you mad because this is the actual trend. And if you consider that more than half the fish are being harvested in the 50s and 60s, that's the actual trajectory. And again, why did this happen? All four H's contributed in the early years, but in more recent years, perhaps one H in particular. The blue stars represent main stem so-called passable dams built above Bonneville since 1957. And these last four are the Snake River dams. And you can see that this steep decline is coincident with the completion of those four dams. I'll come back and talk about this spike in the early 2000s in a few minutes. So here's the path of our fish. They come out of the salmon, they go down the snake, they go on the Columbia. They do this arc off the Aleutians. They may do that three times, just remarkable. This is where the changes have occurred. And evidence suggests this is the primary cause of our salmon declines because it's been coincident with development of this hydro system. Our fish must now go down through eight dams to the ocean as smolts and then return through those same eight dams on their way back as adults. And NIMF's own documents state that this is a primary threat to viability. A couple of quotes I'll read here. Fantastic fishing for salmon and steel had continued in Idaho through the 50s and 60s and not by coincidence began to steeply decline about the time the last shovel of dirt went into Lower Granite Dam. That's the eighth dam in the early 70s. And this is a quote by Idaho fish and game biologist. Idaho steelhead anglers were dealt a severe blow with the unprecedented emergency closure of the state's waters to fishing. The foremost killer of our salmon and steel had is recognized as a snake in Columbia River dams. That was back in 1974. So what changes have occurred? Well, the first change is in the SAR stage, that's small to adult return rate. In the 1960s, with four dams in place, SARs averaged 3.5 to 6.5. As those additional four dams were built, SARs often dropped below 1%. And in fact, from 2000 to 2018, SARs average 0.7, less than 1%. And again, this is the power council goal, two to six mean of four. So we're far, far below even the lower bounds of that. Second change is dramatic in-river changes. We now have 325 miles of reservoir in what was formerly free-flowing river. And if you look at the two photos of the, from the 40s and the 50s, you can see a lot of complexity in the channel. This is what it looks like today and it has since 1972. It's just a reservoir, slack water. 
And what that also means is water travel times for smolts have become much, much slower. Smolts used to reach the ocean from where lower granite sits two days in two days. Now it averages almost 20. In drought years, it's 40. And the importance of this is smolts are going through a physiological change that allows them to go from fresh water to salt water. And so the timing of that migration is really critical. And if they're delayed too much, they suffer much higher mortality. Third change is delayed mortality. It's basically each dam encountered impacts juvenile steelhead. It's, it's analogous to running a gauntlet. They become so beaten up after going through eight dams and reservoirs that few survive. And in fact, the data show that almost three quarters of fish that pass through the whole system die as a result of injury or stress. So we can see the cumulative effects of multiple dams. The blue line here is a Snake River above eight dams. The red line is the John Day above three dams. And you should be able to see into the early 1970s, those lines are fairly parallel. And then they really start to diverge as those sixth, seventh, and eighth dams are built. And today our fish survive a quarter as well as those downriver fish. Huxley also said an unexciting truth may be eclipsed by a thrilling lie. Well, here's a thrilling lie. We are seeing survival numbers for juvenile fish that rival and sometimes exceed what you see on undammed rivers. So according to this person, dams are really good for salmon. Here's the unexciting truth. This is a plot of dams, number of dams to pass on the horizontal and Chinook SARs on the vertical. John Day above three dams, SAR 3.5. Yakima above four dams, SARs 2.5. We would kill in the Snake Basin to have those SARs. These, these fish are not ESA listed. Snake River fish are because our SARs are now 0 0.7, again, above eight dams. And there's that 4% average goal. This is a similar data for steelhead. Two dams, 5%. Three dams, 4.9%. Four dams, 4%. And Snake River, eight dams, one3 and the important piece of this data is these fish all go to the same area of the ocean. So they've been experiencing the same heat area, hot area called so-called blob, same sea lion predation at the dams, same treaty and non-treaty fishery. The difference is the number of dams they pass. And so those dams are really dramatically influencing the SARs. Fifth change is much higher water temperatures in those reservoirs. They are acting as heat sinks. And in fact, in 2015, low flow and hot water conditions killed nearly 380,000 sockeye migrating into the Columbian snake. Most of those fish were going into the upper Columbia. In Idaho, we have ESA listed sockeye in Redfish Lake and 96% of those fish died between Bonneville Dam and Lower Granite Dam, the uppermost dam because of high temperatures. And the scary thing is fish kills like this, based on the modeling that's been done by climatologists, is going to become much more common. And in fact, we saw more of this last year. So the Columbia River today is the most hydro-developed salmon habitat in the world. The other thing that's hampered recovery is ignored science and policy. There's a great document. You can find this on the internet. It's by Megiddo and Ebel. 1994, and it's basically a history of the Corps of Engineers in the Columbia Basin. And there's a lot of lessons here about the perils of ignoring science. 1933, the Corps chief engineer was a sharp guy, and he said, before the actual construction of any dam is started, studies must be made to determine the best method for passing salmon. Well, he was ignored, and it really wasn't until the 1950s that rigorous studies were done to learn how to pass fish. 1938, no facilities had been installed for passing juvenile fish, and a core report said there is little danger of injury to small fish. Well, that was at best an uninformed guess. 1952, core funded research documented juvenile fish mortalities of 15 to 30 percent per dam. Those data were suppressed and they weren't released to the public. 1955, Inland Empire Waterways Association said, all passage issues have been resolved. That was a clear distortion of the truth. And finally, in the 1970s, more rigorous core studies confirm juvenile fish losses of more than 20% per dam. The current estimate is 23% per dam. 
So 23% eight times, and you come up with a really, really small number. 1972, the Endangered Species Act was passed. 1980, Congress recognized that hydro was a major factor in salmon declines, and prior legislation had been ineffective, and they passed the Northwest Power Act. And it marked a really critical shift in federal policy because on paper, it required equitable treatment of fish and wildlife with other uses. It created the Power and Conservation Council. And a lot of us at that time thought this was gonna mark the turning point for recovery of Snake River Basin salmon and steelhead. So how successful was it? Well, the program was created in 1980. By the early 90s, all Snake River anadromous fish were ESA listed. Basically, the Power Council, the Northwest Power Act was politicized and the good language that was in there was never actually implemented. In Idaho, we're blessed to have the largest wilderness area in the lower 48, the Frank Church. It's a very large area, it has core habitat for a number of ESA listed and sensitive species, and it has exceptional habitat. Way back in the 40s, biologists said it's arguably the finest natal habitat for salmon and steelhead in the whole Columbia Basin. And that hasn't changed. If anything, it's even better than it was because some of the impacts that were in there historically are gone now. So what are trends in these populations? This is a population that I work with and we do red counts and we can multiply the red or nest counts times two to get an approximation, approximation of adults. So how do Middle Fork trends compare to the Snake River? There's the Snake River. And what you should see is that these lines are pretty much parallel. It's the same trend, which is interesting because the Middle Fork being in wilderness has optimal habitat. There are no hatchery fish here, very low harvest rates I'll talk about in a few minutes. So basically only one of the four H's applies here and that's the Hydro H. And this tells us that the trajectory of both of these populations is being driven by that hydro system. All Middle Fork populations are non-viable and at high risk of extinction from low abundance and low productivity. This is from National Marine Fishery Service own documents. But if you're like Homer and you read the papers last year, 2022, it was a good year for fish. 2022 spring Chinook season, a good year for salmon. Snake River Chinook returns increase again, contra contradicting claims of dam opponents. This has been a great year for Spring Chinook. So how was it? Here's a plot of Middle Fork red counts from 1995 to 2021. Here's 2022. We had about a doubling. So how does that compare to what we think should be in this system? historical versus current abundance. You can see in 2023, we had about a 60% decline back down from 2022. We were averaging about 713 reds in that 29 year period. 1950s and 60s abundances in that system were 24,000. So we're averaging 3% across this whole data range. 2022 was 3.5%. 2023, we're back down to 1%. And I guess one of the take homes here is a doubling or even five times abysmal numbers is still abysmal. Additional fish is positive. We're happy with that, but we're still bouncing around just above extinction for these stocks. So in summary, we have troubling news. We have unique wild stocks and core wilderness habitat that's at high risk of extinction. What, is, what has been the federal response? Well, they're mandated to have recovery plans and so-called biological opinions, biops, that provide actions to offset impacts on ESA-listed fish. There have been five biops since 1994. And what's been the focus? Unfortunately, it's been on natal habitat restoration, and I'll explain why that's unfortunate. Same approach, all five biops. How effective is that? Well, if natal habitat degradation is responsible, then stocks in high quality habitat, like we have in central Idaho and the Snake River Basin, should be faring better than stocks in degraded habitat. But they're not. We have this experimental control. We have wild salmon and wilderness, and these stocks are at high risk of extinction. 
So natal habitat regeneration is not going to be sufficient to achieve recovery. And there's other research that agrees. This publication, natal habitat actions are not going to produce increases in the survival needed for the Snake River populations, potential improving overall survival through habitat restoration is low to non-existent for most 84% of populations. Are there places where natal habitat restoration is beneficial? Yes, absolutely. Places like the Lemhi River that have been severely degraded, it's been channelized, it's been dewatered, tributaries have been disconnected. So restoration work here is positive, but let's look at some numbers. What were the red counts in the early 1960s? This is when arguably the Lemhi was in its worst condition because the degradation really started post-World War II, continued through the 50s into the early 60s. Well, in those early 60s years, we averaged almost 1,600 reds in the, in the Lemhi system. Contrast that with contemporary Lemhi, lots of lots of work being done to restore channels, dramatically improved Natal habitat, new channels, restoring the complexity, reconnecting tributaries, a lot of cooperation from the ranchers. What are the red counts? Since 2019, we've averaged about 3% of what was there in the 60s. So part of the point here is that quality natal habitat is essential, but habitat itself doesn't make salmon. Salmon makes salmon. The issue here is getting fish to the ocean and back again. And even if we had the money and time to restore the Snake River Basin to wilderness condition like we have in central Idaho, those data show that we still would have ESA listed fish because we can't get them safely to and from the ocean. So we have flawed recovery plans up to now that have really hampered recovery. Trends in wild stocks and wilderness confirm within basin actions are not sufficient. We have to work in the migration corridor. And the courts agree. All five biological opinions were rejected as not scientifically sound. There's also been political tampering. I'm gonna read this astounding quote. The 2004 BIOP was based on the astonishing assertion that because the dams were built before the enactment of ESA, they are as much a part of the natural environment as waterfalls even though the current document acknowledges huge salmon mortality caused by dams. So this is clear political tampering where NOAA Fisheries was not allowed to use the data that they knew was there. Um, instead, these kind of messages were put out to the public. So here's one fact. Despite $25 billion spent on fish and wildlife restoration in the basin, all snake river anatomous fish remain at high risk of extinction. Jim Norton has called this the most expensive failed ecological recovery project in US history. 1992 is when Barney came on the scene. 1992 is also when wild spring summer Chinook were listed as threatened under ESA. A little over 12,000 Chinook returned to Lower Granite Dam, the uppermost dam. From 2018 to 2023, we've averaged less than 9,000 wild Chinook. So that means that after 30 years and more than 25 billion spent, we're experienced, we've, we now have a 30% decline compared to what was there in 92 when they were listed. So things obviously aren't working. Columbia Basin today has one to 2% of historical run sizes on average. There's something called the shifting baseline syndrome. You may have heard of it. It was postulated by Pauli back in 95. And it means with each generation, our expectation of ecological conditions shifts downward and standards are lowered. And so on this timeline, we tend to view things based on what we currently experience. And the danger is we really need to be using the full data range as I illustrated with the uh, systems operation parsing of the data. The baseline syndrome is dangerous because it means we don't have an awareness of historical abundance. It means we overlook true potential and we can it can result in unrealistically low recovery goals. The other thing that happens on the other side is even modest improvements are inaccurately seen as much more than they are, so-called record runs. And here's an example. So this is a plot of Columbia River Chinook salmon harvest immense numbers of fish harvested starting in the 
late 1870s, continued into the 1920s, and then the hydro development started in the system, and then we see this precipitous decline. Well, in 2016, the Seattle Times had a, a, a title, Record-Breaking Columbia River Salmon Runs Now a Daily Occurrence. Well, there's no way the 2016 runs were anywhere near record-breaking. Again, over simplification. Here's an example of the actual bounty that we had. This is from the Lemhi River in Idaho. 23 salmon up to 43 pounds caught in one day by two men. And this is certainly excessive harvest by our standards today, but the point is this is the abundance that was in these systems. And with so few fish today, we now have a loss of economic values, cultural recreational values, and importantly, a dramatic reduction in ecosystem productivity and function. This is a plot, the red lines show where you can legally fish for hatchery steelhead in Idaho today, those red lines. The green lines illustrate where you formerly could fish for wild steelhead into the 1970s before the populations collapsed. So you can see the lost opportunity here is dramatic. And the opportunity meant a decline in quantity. These are fish from the late 60s, early 70s. Those are steelhead. Those are immense fish. Compared to today, that's a hatchery fish. You can see the difference in quality. No wonder the guy on the right isn't smiling. <laughs> so here's a plot of over 1,300 years of nutrients in redfish lake sediments. This is stable iso isotopic nitrogen. And you see it bounces around, but then you go to the right side of the graph and you see that highlighted area, and that steep decline, that's when the dams began to be installed in the Columbia system. And basically we're headed for bankruptcy. We're losing those essential nutrients that are part of that system. Maslow said, if the only two you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. Well, the hammer that's been used in the Columbia Basin up to now has been natal habitat restoration and minor hydrosystem improvements. And that's not going to successfully recover these fish. That's because this is where the bottleneck is. When you have these low SARs, failure to improve them is not going to be an effective response. And that's because we know that 80% of the variation in salmon survival is explained by SARs. And when SARs are less than 1%, like we're experiencing, we see these steep population declines toward extinction. So the proper tool for recovery is this, increase those SARs. And the way we do that is we speed up the river so that water travel times are reduced and we reduce the number of powerhouses those fish have to go through. And in fact, one of the judges, Simon, clearly said these dams are causing irreparable harm to imperiled fish. And he directed the agencies to assess all prudent reasonable and prudent alternatives, including removal or breaching of the four lower snake dams. And that is finally on the table. So we know that factors outside these basins are what's driving the trajectory of the population. How do we know that? One of the ways we know it is when we have these increases like we had in the early 2000s, these are the trajectories that we'd expect. The actual trajectory was this, from 03 to 06, we had a tenfold, excuse me, tenfold decline. And that's because the factors that cause these fish to be listed in the first place persist. Increased mortality outside the area after the smolts leave negates the benefits of those additional adults and juveniles produced in natal habitat. So poor migration conditions are causing these low SARs that are driving these population trajectories. So actions in the migration corridor are essential to increase SCRs. There's no within natal habitat solution for these fish. So what can be? Well, if we have a foundation recovery for recovery based on science-based frameworks, we can succeed. We need an informed public, that's you, and policymakers that are influenced by that informed public. And we need migration corridor actions to improve SARs two to six fold. I wanna talk about the ocean for a second. Ocean conditions dramatically affect salmon survival. They always have, they always will. 
when we have favorable conditions, which are typically for our fish, cold water upwelling, more food, more copepods, high lipid content copepods, we see more returns from the ocean. When you have unfavorable ocean, which is warmer temperatures, lack of upwelling, lower food abundance, then we have fewer salmon return. But we have limited ability to influence ocean conditions except for limiting carbon emissions as part of the overall climate effects that we're trying to limit. And in fact, the Independent Science Advisory Board for the Columbia Basin has said climate change is considered an uncontrollable factor at the program basin level. In contrast, human-caused hydrodevelopment is clearly linked to salmon declines. Those reduced SARs I talked about, those increased water travel times, and we have extensive ability to improve these conditions because we created them. And in fact, the Independent Science Board has said, this is a controllable factor as a, at the program basin level. So there is a path forward. In the 1990s, more than 30 participants from 15 state and federal agencies, tribes, universities, consultants gathered as part of the plan for analyzing and testing hypotheses to look at what can we do to recover these fish? This was in the, in the 90s. Well, in 1998, they came out with their final report and they said, the only option that will provide recovery is the natural river option, restoring the snake. It has the highest certain success, lowest risk of failure. Well, that was in 1998. And those path conclusions have been reaffirmed by scientific review panels, agencies, scientists for the last 25 years. They just have still have not yet been implemented. The comparative survival study estimated a two to three-fold increase in abundance with the natural river option and a four-fold increase if it's coupled with spill over the existing, over the remaining Columbia River dams. And here's a quote from 2021. Emeritus scientists wrote to Northwest governors based on overwhelming scientific evidence, restoration of a free-flowing lower snake is essential to recover wild Pacific salmon and steelhead. And finally, last fall, NOAA Fisheries came out with a report where they basically said, breach must be part of any solution to recover these stocks. So there's been a lot of movement on this issue, finally embracing the science that we've had since the 1990s. And that's because improving SARs is gonna be a much more effective solution to recovering these populations. What I'm going to do now is focus in on the area where I work more specifically, the Middle Fork Salmon River. I've talked about it a little bit. It's a good area to look at wild Chinook in high quality wilderness habitat, and it forms what can be. So there's a lot of collaborators here with my own entity, the Rocky Mountain Research Station, but also state, federal, tribal entities, as well as universities. So we have some remarkable databases here in the Middle Fork. Idaho Fish and Game started red counts in this system back in 1957 in index reaches of certain streams there shown in the red on the left. So we have a 66 year database that was started by these iconic biologists. Second database is one we started at the Rocky Mountain Station in the early 90s. It's a complete census of all the other areas of the system that aren't part of that index count. We now have almost, we have 29 years of data here. So we have this spatially continuous, temporally replicated data set showing where fish are spawning in that system. Each one of those red dots represents a Chinook salmon red. So a really powerful data set from an analytical standpoint. And we have data from carcasses. I, I only talked today about uh, DNA. There's a lot of other information we can gain from Chinook carcasses because they all die after spawning. And finally, we're assessing effects of natural disturbances in that basin. So some applications, what have we learned about essential habitat? Well, the Middle Fork is an excellent location to study because we can control for several variables, specifically the four H's. The Middle Fork has high quality, complex, connected natal habitat, again, arguably the finest in the Columbia Basin. So we can take the habitat H off the table. It's not a limiting factor here. We have unique wild fish in this system. There are no hatcheries in the Middle Fork, no hatchery fish are stocked there. Only 4% of the Columbia Basin still supports wild fish like these. So these are literally 
the rarest of the rare and the best of the best. No others in the world spawn so high, up to 6,600 feet in elevation, migrate so far over 900 miles. A friend of mine calls them mariners and mountaineers, and that's a really apt description. They have very diverse life histories. They spend less than a year in freshwater, two years, less than a year in saltwater, up to five years. Precocial males mature entirely in freshwater. If you add all that up, we can have 18 different age classes contributing from prior brood years. Tremendous diversity, and that spreads the risk, buffers fluctuations, and enables these stocks to adapt to a dynamic environment. They're also still genetically diverse, surprisingly, with the low numbers we've been experiencing. You have both within and across population differentiation. So fish in lower Camas Creek are different than fish in upper Camas Creek, and Camas Creek fish differ from loon, from big, et cetera. What do we know about harvest? Well, the good news is based on tagging studies, the ocean harvest of these stocks is very low, less than 1% harvest rate. And the treaty and non-treaty fishery is taking an average of about 9%. It's tightly regulated, more than we'd like to see at these low numbers, but these are not driving these fish toward extinction. So low harvest, the, habit, the harvest age is pretty much off the table too. And it's been 45 years since you could legally harvest a wild Chinook in Idaho, since 1978. What, what do we know about resiliency? Well, what is resiliency? It's a, to me, it's ability to withstand negative conditions that would drive these stocks to extinction, and conversely, ability to respond when conditions improve. I've been teasing you with that spike in the early 2000s up there in the right corner of the Snake River. Well, that's, this is when it occurred. 2001 through 2003, we had a five-fold increase in number of adult Chinook returning to central Idaho. And it was a result of two things. We had more water, rain, snow, and faster travel time when those fish went out to the ocean. And when we have faster travel time and more water, more survived through the hydro system. And then we had a corresponding increase in ocean productivity, up cold water upwelling, so we had this five-fold increase in adults return. There were actually newspaper articles when this occurred that said, we've solved the salmon recovery crisis. We didn't solve anything. Mother Nature did us a favor. But the important point here is the fish responded. They are still resilient, even though they've been bouncing around these very low numbers. And as we talked about before, it wasn't sustained. We had a tenfold decline, illustrating that the conditions that drove these to be listed still persist. What do we know about landscape processes? Western landscapes are very dynamic. We have fires, we have floods, we have avalanches, we have debris flows. These fish evolved here. And a couple of key concepts, one is complex life histories like this result from those disturbances. And life history diversity is the solution of survival in these dynamic environments. And diversity reduces risk, the so-called portfolio effect. The more diverse populations are, the fewer eggs there are in a single basket. So these natural ecological processes, fires, floods, debris flows, alter the landscape to create this diverse habitat template upon which salmon can express life history as well as genetic diversity, and these lead to population resiliency. So if we're gonna build a blueprint for recovery of Snake River stocks, the middle fork stocks are a good indicator for salmon in a much broader region. We would need diverse genetics. We would need abundant quality connected habitat. We need unique locally adapted fish and high resiliency. So there's a lot of good news here. We have all of these building blocks to restore these populations. Climate change is here. We're seeing lower summer flows, changes in runoff, warmer water. As I said, lethal at times. And the ocean is warming. We're increased acidity, delayed transition areas. All these are bad news. And we know that low elevation cold water areas are gonna warm and probably become unsuitable. Even here, there's good news because the Snake River Basin will provide cold water refugia even into the future of climate change. The Snake River Basin contains the coldest, most intact stream habitats in the lower 48. 40% of the public land in the snake is within wilderness. 
40% of the available cold water habitat lies in the snake. By 2080, it's predicted that 45% will be in the snake basin. So although a changing climate adds urgency for action, Central Idaho's high elevation habitats in the snake are gonna persist. How does SAMLA survive the future? I'm gonna read this quote. In environments facing increasingly volatile futures, it is prudent to promote and maintain diverse life history portfolios. And salmon are buffered to changing conditions by behavioral and life history diversity. Restoring salmon numbers is a priority because it increases buffering. So these wild locally adapted fish in the Snake Basin are gonna be best suited to adapt to the uncertain future of climate change. And the more we have, the more buffering they'll be and the more likely they will persist for our grandkids and beyond. So if restored, wild salmon and steelhead can are best suited to adapt to that uncertain future. There's even the potential for these high elevation stocks to refound populations at lower elevations on the coastal areas. The reverse is not gonna happen. You're not gonna train a coastal fish to migrate 900 miles and climb 6,600 feet. How do we know snake river restoration is gonna succeed? All the building blocks persist demonstrated wild fish resiliency, decades of science going back into the 90s, and successful restoration examples, the Elwha, the white salmon, Kennebec, Penobscot, Noose, Padapsco, Baraboo, Nooksack, and in 2023, one of the three Klamath dams that are coming out was removed. In 2021, 57 dams were removed that reconnected over 2,100 miles of stream. So there's a dynamic tension here. We have wild salmon and steel at high risk from a degraded migration corridor, from low abundance, from truth distortion, from political tampering, and a changing climate adds urgency to act. But there's also a lot of good news. We have wild fish, they're resilient, they have refugia, and they have quality natal habitat. And if actions are taken to restore SARs in that migration corridor, there is absolutely no question these fish are gonna respond and rebuild relatively rapidly. And what these are photos from salmon, the, the archive here in the little town of salmon, 3000 people. What once was, those are steelhead. Some fish up to 40 inches. Can be steelhead as big as your children. Again, Here's one of the things people did on their honeymoons in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The bottom line is barging, irrigation, energy production, values from those Snake River dams have alternatives. They can be replaced. Idaho's wild salmon and steelhead are irreplaceable. If we lose them, there's no other fish on the planet that can replace them. And with that, I'd be happy to try to answer questions. I'm gonna put my email up here too. If we don't get to some of your questions or if you think of stuff later, feel free to email me and I'd be glad to do my best to answer your questions. Well, thanks Russ. That was, uh, that was very informative to say the least. Um, really appreciate that. Um, before we jump into questions or, or take a deep dive into this, can we maybe take a step back and maybe talk about, I, I want to give you a minute to maybe explain your story. Like, how did you get from a small farm in southeast Wisconsin to spending <laughs> 40 years in, in the middle of Idaho studying salmon and steelhead? Like, connect the dots for me. Okay. Um, yeah, I grew up on a farm in southeast near Ashapin, Neosho, I attended high school at Hartford and uh, ended up applying and, and going to Stevens Point, which again, I said is where I met Bob and had a, a really important person uh, that became my professional mentor, Jack Heaton. He's one of the people that built the fisheries program at Point. And it was at the time, one of the finest fisheries programs in the country. And I worked hard and, and was offered uh, an assistantship to go to University of Idaho, where I did my graduate work. And ultimately I was hired by Idaho Fish and Game as a research biologist. And I worked for them until 1990, 
And I began a lot of this work on, on Chinook and Steelhead when I worked for Idaho Fish and Game. And then in 1990, the U.S. Forest Service started a research project. At the time, it was called the Intermountain Research Station, and then they um, changed their name to Rocky Mountain. And our headquarters are in Fort Collins. And I worked with them from 1990 until 2022 and uh, theoretically retired, although I'm still working on a number of things. And I'm currently an emeritus scientist, which means I still work under the research station um, and I'm still publishing information and working on these issues. That's great. I always love, love hearing the Wisconsinite stories about us going out into the world and doing good things. So um, we're certainly glad you're out there and, and glad you're doing the work that you're doing and appreciate you um, trying to educate some of us folks, you know, I mean, I was just talking to my wife about this over um, the holidays. You know, what the kids asked, what states have you been to or what states haven't you been to? We made the list and Idaho was on both of our lists this year. I was like, well, <laughs> we got to we got to change that, you know. And uh, so it, it's definitely it's on the list and, and I think it's going to happen. But um, getting back to the, the seriousness, seriousness of the subject, um, could you maybe talk a little bit um but like we know there's so there's eight dams, seven dams kind of primarily like that these fish have to navigate around to get up into the upper snake system. Um, what are the interests or like what is the function of the dams or like, like there's obviously some some pretty heavy interests in keeping those dams in place, right? Otherwise, they would have gotten taken out a long time ago. So what what are kind of the interests that you're up against here? Yeah. So to clarify, so the Columbia River dams are major, major power producers in the Columbia system. And no one is proposing removing or breaching the Columbia dams because they are they are big drivers of power production okay. in particular and uh, other values. The Snake River dams were built. It It sounds absurd, but it's the truth. They were built to make Lewiston, Idaho, an inland seaport. And what that means is there's a lot of wheat production in the Palouse, which is near Lewiston, Idaho. And the idea was, oh, we'll build these reservoirs and we'll be able to barge wheat from Lewiston down to Portland. And it'll be a boon for everybody. And first of all, it was never really an economic boon to Lewiston. That's never materialized. Lewiston is being subsidized at the cost of a half million dollars a year, and it's losing money, the Port of Lewiston. Um, so the, the transport of wheat is one of the values that the Snake River dams do provide. However, and, and you know, I'm a biologist, not a wheat transport expert or economist, but my understanding is that the rail system is much more efficient, it's cheaper, it's more reliable. One of the problems with the barge traffic is with river conditions under climate change and low flows, the barging doesn't always get to Portland on time, and that's a big deal. So one of the values transporting wheat can easily be replaced by a more efficient system, rail system. Um, the power production by the four lower snake dams is pretty minor. It averages about 4% of the base in the Columbia. And I've actually seen reports that have suggested that energy conservation alone can compensate for the power that they produce. Now, some of the recent plans, the one that just came out here recently between what's called the, the six sovereigns and the administration, is to put a lot of effort into renewable energy sources, particularly solar, but also wind, to compensate for the production from these four lower snake dams. The other value that the dams provide is in those reservoirs, they do provide irrigation, but it's a pump irrigation. They're pumping up out of the reservoirs. And if the river is restored, that water is still going to be there. They can still, you know, it'll have to change probably the the location of where the water is pumped from, but 
the irrigators are not going to lose their water. They still have those water rights. It's just that we'd have a free flowing river to allow us to rebuild those, those populations. And those are really the, the major uh, values. Um, you know, I think the, the rewilding of the snake is another one of those issues that, you know, there's a lot of opposition to change. The, the people that have had the benefits don't want to see change. Um, but there, there is some acknowledgement that, you know, if we lose these fish, we lose really some, somebody wrote that the definition of the Pacific Northwest is anywhere salmon can, can go. And if we lose these fish in the Snake Basin, I mean, I ask people, if these fish go extinct, what are we going to do? We're going to rename the Salmon River, the Extinction River? We're going to rename Salmon Idaho, Extinction Idaho? I mean, they're part of the fabric of the Northwest and have been for, like I said, for the indigenous people, at least 16,000 years. Yeah. I know personally, we, we, you know, our our family this year, or I guess last year, we we all took our first trip to the Pacific Northwest and and like were blown away by just how immense the landscape was and you know how beautiful and pristine and um it, it's amazing country for sure. So um so let's say I saw one of the slides was talking about like how long it takes for the juveniles to, to get through the system, like, you know, before you had the dams, I mean, they could get out to the ocean in a matter of, you know, a couple of days, essentially. Right. And then like, now you've got all these dams to navigate around. Plus, like you said, the reservoirs, you know, of standing water instead of like free flowing water. Um, so they're not getting that extra boost on their way out to the ocean. And now it takes them like, you know, two, three, four weeks or more. Um, maybe five or six, I think maybe it's said up to 40 days, I think on your slide. Um, if we, if we take out these four lower snake river dams, like how much, how much of that timeline do you think you could cut down on the trip to the ocean for these fish? I mean, it would, it would be dramatically reduced. It would be yeah. much faster. And, you know, that's part of it. And I mean, the, the estimates of, well, again, what I what I tell people when I give public presentations, just as an illustration. So take a piece of paper and make a column one through eight vertical column, and then start out with 500,000 smolts and subtract 23% at each one of those eight and see the number you come, come up with. And then go back and take four of those dams out and see what you get. You still lose the 23% at the four Columbia dams, but see what that number is. And then consider the fact that the SARs for those fish are gonna be in the neighborhood of 3%. And if you start to look at how that rebuilds, I mean, some of the predictions are we could have fishable populations again in less than 15 years because these fish are really resilient and the fish in central Idaho produce a lot of eggs. The average female has 5,000 eggs. So for every 100, 500,000 returning adults, that's just gonna keep building over time. And you're almost getting exponential increases once you get those SARs up to the levels that the power council is saying. If we got you know, even a 2% SAR, we'd see rebuilding. If we get the three, if we get the four, you know, those populations are going to rebuild very rapidly. And we know from the 60s that with four dams in place, we were getting SARs up to 6%. Um, while we're talking about SARs, nobody really knows what SARs were pre-dam, but, you know, it's likely they were probably in good water years, 10% or more. Um, you know, again, nobody's nobody's talking about taking out the four Columbia dams. We can have those dams in place and still have viable populations in the basin. Sure. Again, we know, we know that from the data in the 1960s. Yeah. 
Kay made a comment. Um, she's a friend who who works for an electric company in Washington. And they supposedly truck manure or mature salmon around the dams to improve the migration. Um, are you aware of this, or could you maybe talk about some of the ways that that fish that we, what things have we done in the specifically in the Columbia River dams to help those salmon get around those those dams? Yeah. Um... You know, there are places where there are, are dams with no ladders and things like that. And people have proposed putting fish, you know, above them and transporting them. And, you know, certainly that can be done. And maybe those fish can spawn successfully if there's still reasonable habitat, natal habitat. But if you're going to have wild self-sustaining populations, you really need to have a migration corridor that they can successfully get through. There have been a lot of efforts in the Columbia Basin to trap smolts above some of the dams and then transport them in trucks around the dams. And in some of the extreme drought years, that has there has been some increased survival in transported fish. But there's also issues with that because, <clears throat> again, these fish are going through a physiological change when they're crowded and trapped and put in a, a tanker truck, there can be a, a lot of stress on the fish. There can be disease outbreaks. So again, that's not a long-term solution. The, the sockeye transportation has pretty much been reduced dramatically because it has been shown to actually have detrimental effects over just letting the fish try to migrate on their own. So, you know, some of the sort of artificial fixes like that really aren't, don't have long-term um, solutions. They're, they're not long-term solutions, I guess I should say. Um, much more viable to, to have a open connected migration corridor. Um, the other thing I, you know, I should mention about the reservoirs and, you know, we were talking about the migration of smolts. So, there's multiple factors that are creating these low SARs and the mortality. You know, one of them is the delays. Another one is when those fish are in those reservoirs, the reservoirs are full of introduced predators. There's walleye, there's largemouth bass, there's northern pike. And these smolts are, you know, they're five to eight inches long and they're silver and it's like they're man, snack you know, size. Absolutely. You know, and so that's a huge part of the, of the mortality. And then the other one is the actual physical passage through the dam. And, you know, there's a number of different bypass things and other things, but the bottom line is none of them are good. And even the fish that survive, as we talked about, after doing that eight times, there's a cumulative effect and they're just beaten up and a lot of them just aren't going to return as adults. They've run that gauntlet and they're just not going to survive to come back as adults. Yeah. Um, Ron had, a, had an interesting question here. I think that that might be a good one to, to maybe end on. Um, it says, what are the lessons from the Klamath Dam removal successes that could be applied to the Snake River issue? Well, unfortunately, really tell. yeah, um, unfortunately, the, the Elwha and the white salmon and the Klamath, those, it, it's a little different situation than the snake because the snake dams were authorized by Congress. Those other dams were pretty much by private utilities. And so it was part of the relicensing Um approach that allowed them to be questioned, like, do we really want to keep these? Are the impacts they're having on the fish runs really worth? So it's a little bit different. It was, I, I guess what I'm saying is it was an easy, easier path to have those dams breached and taken out in the Elwha, the white salmon, the, the Klamath, than it will be in the snake. But that doesn't mean that we still can't do that. And again, if, I mean, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I wish we had more people in Congress like William Proxmire. Those of you that remember William Proxmire, 
he was someone, he was a, a Wisconsin congressman and he was very fiscally conservative. And if somebody like Proxmire would have seen 25 billion spent with a 30% reduction in numbers of salmon over 30 years, they, you know, he would have been on that issue and, and would be doing everything he can to write that. So, you know, we need people to look at this. It's a very compelling story. The, the phenomenal benefits to the Northwest of restoring these fish. I mean, the communities like mine are drying up because the fishing is just, it's not here anymore. The hatchery fisheries that are supported now are just a fraction of what, what it was. And the, the tribes, the cultural values that they're not receiving and the ecological values to these systems. I mean, um, I also work on West Slope Cutthroat. The Salmon River Basin has a viable West Slope Cutthroat population but like in the Middle Fork in the wilderness, the the size of cutthroat is declining precipitously from what was there in the 70s. And we don't have a good treatment control, but it's very likely tied to the reduction in marine derived nutrients that these salmon used to return. If we've got a minute, I'd like to show one more slide. Sure. And talk about this for a sec. So a lot of people say, well, why don't we just give up on the wild fish and produce more hatchery fish? And there are a lot of hatchery fish in the basin. Again, we haven't had a wild fishery in Idaho since 1978. So we'd have no fishery if not for some hatchery fish. But hatchery fish are raised in a controlled environment and they aren't subjected to the natural selection that strengthen these wild fish. That's one point. The other point is it's impossible for hatcheries to maintain the diverse life histories and local adaptations that are going to be essential for the future, especially with this uncertain future of climate change. Hatchery fish are of a lot lower fitness. You guys are probably aware when hatchery fish interbreed with wild fish, the wild population declines, the, the productivity declines, the fitness declines. And finally, there's some um, recent work a um, lot, lot of good stuff coming out in genetics. And amazingly, after one generation, hatchery steelhead differed from wild fish in more than 700 genes. That's pretty alarming. And a lot of these genes were linked to migration, migration timing. So hatchery fish can be considered an interim measure to maintain opportunity or recreational fishing and also for the tribes to harvest some fish, but it's really not a long-term solution. And if we can rebuild these wild runs, eventually a lot of these hatcheries will be phased out because again, the, these fish just, they aren't the purebreds that the wild fish are, and they're not gonna have the ability to adapt to the uncertain future that's already here with climate change. Yeah, absolutely. I'll go back to your quote, you know, from the presentation that, that I jotted down, like people don't make salmon, salmon make salmon, right? <laughs> right, so, that's right. And yep. We know yep. we're dealing with very similar issues here in Wisconsin. We've got our native brook trout and in a lot of places are getting crowded out by, by brown trout, you know, non-native species that tends to be, grow a little bigger and they're a little more aggressive and, and they get the best lies in the stream and and they find the right. best spawning habitat, um, and and the brook trout are kind of left to to pick pick up the pieces, you know, what they can. And um, but like you know, people are realizing, you know, if we can give them, even in places where the populations are, are way in decline, if you give them just just give them an inch or two inches, a little bit of space, right? They will, re like you said, they lay so many eggs, and there are species. Much like, you know, just like salmon and steelhead, they can repopulate a population in a hurry if they're given the right mm -hmm. conditions. So um, yep. that I certainly hope, you know, um, that we don't see them go extinct in my lifetime and certainly not in anybody's lifetime at coming after us as well. So um, yep. I guess I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, 
I'm going to close out. Uh, I know you're a good friend of Bob Bretko, and he was kind of the reason he reached out to me and, and let me know what, what you were up to. And I, I certainly appreciate Bob doing that. And uh, I think it's been a really interesting conversation tonight. And uh, Bob had a quote here that he left in the chat, and I'm just going to read this. And I think uh, I think we'll leave it at that. So Bob's message was, uh, it says, being Midwesterners, many of us are unaware of the dramatic salmon decline in the Northwest. Uh, the decline is not a local issue. It is a national issue, somewhat comparable to the decimation of the American bison. When one looks at the numbers, uh, it says, Russ, thanks you for, thank you for the excellent presentation. Russ Force educating us. So <laughs> thank you. We really appreciate you taking the time tonight. And uh, um, for folks that weren't able to join us, I'll go ahead and um, I'll get this up on the YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And uh, uh, really appreciate you taking the time, Russ. So okay. thanks a lot. Can I, can I make one more comment? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So again, you kind of said it in the beginning, why why talk about this to a group of Wisconsin folks? And I mean, this really is a national issue. And, you know, you haven't been to Idaho yet, but I think probably some of your other folks have, and or you've been to Washington, Oregon. Um, you know, this is a, a an issue that's going to benefit a lot of people, not only in the Northwest, but throughout the country. And also just the, you know, the idea of like the old Eldo Leopold quotes of knowing there are places that you still have an intact ecosystem. That's, that's important for all of us. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. The National Trout Unlimited, this is a very important issue on their radar. And I guess I would say if, if your members want to, follow up on this, feel free to reach out to me and also, you know, look on the national website. I think there's probably some um, factual information there about how to, you know, influence your legislators and do things like that, because this, the, the next four years are going to be critical for these fish. There's some good plans out there now. It's just a matter of getting Congress to participate in this and, and help do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. And we will we will do our part to help get it over the over the hump. So thanks again, Russ. Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, hope everybody um, hope some of you get out and uh, enjoy the Wisconsin. The early season, the fishing opener opens this Saturday. So I hope some folks get out there. The weather looks somewhat mild, maybe maybe even above freezing in, in parts of the state. So um, maybe a you know, sneak out and spend an hour on the stream if you get a chance. So, but thanks again, Russ. Really appreciate it. And uh, everybody take care and have a good night. Thank thanks. you. And if you come tonight, I'll look me up. I will do that. Thanks.